So what we're going to talk tonight is about the investigating the most distant universe. And in particular, we're going to talk about something called the cosmic microwave background. And I'm going to talk about what we expect of the cosmic microwave background and how it relates to our theory of the universe. And next week, John Rule is going to be talking about how we measure the cosmic microwave background and what it's told us about the universe. So let's start with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, that is the name of a TV show. It's also the name for the application of Einstein's general theory of relativity to the entire universe. So here is fact is Einstein writing down his entire theory of relativity applied to the universe. That nice equation doesn't look like much, but that's where we get all of cosmology from. Um, and it tells us that the universe started out hot and is expanding and cooling, and that the structures in the universe, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, formed by the gravitational collapse. So places that were denser collapsed under the influence of gravity and are bound together by gravity. So the universe used to be hot. How hot? Well, much, much hotter than, we, than uh, in this room. This room is only about uh, a couple of hundred degrees above absolute zero. But if we go back in time to when the universe was only 380,000 years old, and we'll use words like only in a very different sense than we would normally use them in our everyday conversation. So when it was younger than 380,000 years old, it was, had a temperature above about 3,000 degrees. So the contrast, that, that's about the temperature of a, a nice big red giant star like Betelgeuse. The sun is a little bit warm, about 5,800 degrees. Okay, so about the, the uh, temperature of the surface of a, a star. And back then, there were lots of energetic particles of light that we call photons. So many so, in fact, a billion for every, uh, every proton or electron that was there, that every time a proton and electron would get together to form a hydrogen atom, a photon would come along and just blast it apart. Okay? So because those electrons were there and those hydrogen atoms and those protons, they would scatter the photons. The photons couldn't travel very far. And for that reason, the universe was opaque. You couldn't see through it. When the universe was about 380,000 years old, as it expanded, it was cooling. And at that point, the photons were no longer energetic enough to blast apart the hydrogen. So all those electrons and protons got together and formed neutral hydrogen atoms. And photons are not very good at seeing neutral things. And so the photons stopped scattering off of the electrons and the protons and the hydrogen atoms. And instead, they started traveling freely through the universe. And they've been traveling through the universe pretty much ever since. We say they had their last scattering with the electrons when the universe was about 380,000 years old. And ever since then, they've been traveling freely, mostly affected only by gravity. Occasionally, a photon will have other interactions. And in the meantime, the universe has continued to expand. So our usual picture that you'll, you'll see of the Big Bang and what happens after last scattering is you know, there's kind of this place where there are lots of hot stuff, lots of photons, lots of other things. And they all spread apart from that place. Mm -hmm. That is not what actually happened. Okay. What really happened is that there were lots of photons filling space, lots of other things filling space, and they were just moving through space um, slowly and continuously, not like what just happened in the slide where the computer seems to have slowed down. <laughs> <laughs> and I fear that that's what it's going to do again in, in a moment. Okay. So now. Here, instead of drawing the photons as arrows, let me just paint little red dots for those photons. And imagine those photons are moving around. So they are traveling, all of them, they're traveling every which way through the universe. The common picture is that what we have is a nice big hot spot and isolated in space, and that things move out from there in every direction. That's not what's really happening. What's really happening is that we have space full of photons and other particles. I've just pictured the photons here. And they are moving all over, uh, you know, just willy, every which way. Okay? Let's, do it, let's do it again, but this time with lots more, lots more photons. Okay? So the photons are moving all 
every direction through the space. Okay. And there's no, there's no special place here. Okay. But we are located in a special place. Okay. Here we are on the Earth sitting in this bath of photons. And the photons move around. And the ones that hit us, okay, they've been traveling all the exact same amount of time. Now, if they've been traveling the exact same amount of time, they must have come, since they're all traveling at the speed of light, from the exact same distance from us. So they are all started out back at that time when that last scattering happened, when the age of the universe was 380,000 years. They all started out on this, what here is a circle, and three dimensions would be a sphere. So when we look out, all, the, all of the photons, all the particles of light that happened to hit us at that moment come from a sphere centered on us. And we call that sphere the last scattering surface. Okay. If we wait a minute, that sphere will get bigger. Not because of anything special, just because we're waiting longer, and so the photons travel a little bit further. Okay. So that last scattering surface is just the places where the photons hitting us at this moment happen to come from because the universe happens to be 13 0.8 billion years old today. Okay. So the photons are all come, traveling 13, they're traveling about 13.7, 13.8 billion light years over the course of the history of the universe. Now, while they're doing that, they're actually, they're traveling freely in the sense that they're not hitting anything else, but space itself is stretching. Space is expanding. And you can think of the photons as waves, of, electromag of the electromagnetic field, it's called, traveling through space. And as the space gets stretched, it stretches the photons with them. Okay? So you can imagine just the photons as things that are, as the space expands, it stretches the photons. It makes their wavelength longer. And the longer the wavelength of a photon is, the longer the wavelength of light is, the redder it is. So we, we say that the light is getting red shifted. It starts out. Uh, being uh, normal visible light when the, when the universe, uh, when it was emitted, when this last scattering happened. And over time, over the last 13 and a half billion years, it goes from being visible light to being microwaves. Okay. And at the same time, the energy of the light is being decreased. So a better picture would be more like this. We, so the light started out, let's call it blue, means very energetic. And as time goes on, it's, the particles are moving, but they're also getting redder. Okay. Now, people have known, that, have expected this from the Big Bang Theory. If the universe was, was described by this Big Bang Theory, by general relativity, they had expected this really since the 1940s. Okay. They had known that there, would, there should be a cosmic microwave background, a background of particles of light, of photons that had been emitted when the universe was very hot and then had been traveling through the universe ever since then. And we should be able to look out and see them. Okay. Um, and some scientists were at Princeton University, in fact, designing an experiment to go out and measure it, when these two fellows, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, um, happened to be uh, using a telescope, uh, a big microwave dish uh, owned by Bell Labs. And they noticed that there was some extra radio, extra radiation coming into their telescope, extra microwaves coming into their telescope. Here's a picture of their telescope. It turned out that some of their colleagues had been doing the same things a few years earlier and had been told by their boss to get on with it and keep doing their job, that there's nothing wrong with the telescope. They just weren't calibrating it properly. But Penzias and Wilson happened to run into some folks from Princeton who said, you're seeing extra, extra light in your telescope, extra microwaves. That's not just noise. That is the cosmic microwave background. And so they, for that discovery of the cosmic microwave background, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1978. And this was really a monumental discovery. It, it was the piece of evidence that the Big Bang Theory was the, seemed to be the correct theory to explain the evolution of the universe. Until then, there had been a competing theory that after that slowly died called the steady state theory. Okay. So the Big Bang theory that the universe used to be very hot, has been expanding over time, uh, was vindicated 
by this discovery of the cosmic microarray background. Now this, this background that they saw had a very important property, which is that in every direction that they looked, it looked approximately the same. Okay? It was remarkably smooth. No matter which direction they pointed their telescope, they got microwave radiation of the same intensity at a given wavelength. Okay? So if you like, this is a map of the cosmic microwave background sky. It's a pretty boring map. Uh, to make it more interesting, we don't usually present it like that. We present it like this. Okay? And it's not really more interesting. It's the same thing. Uh, it's just a different projection. So this is the, uh, you know, you can tell by looking at it, this is the equator of the galaxy. This is the north up from the galaxy. This is down from the galaxy. And what we've just done is we've unwrapped the sky and laid it out as an oval on, on the page, okay, on, on, on the flat plane. And this is, it doesn't look like much of a map because there was not much to see. They couldn't tell the difference in the temperature of the radiation looking in different directions. Okay. Now, the, the other thing is that the temperature was only three degrees, 2.728 we know today. Okay. It's only about three degrees. Remember I told you that when the photons last scattered, the, temp the temperature of the universe was about 3,000 degrees. So what had happened in the meantime was that the universe had grown in size by a factor of about 1,000, more like about 1,100. And in that time, each and every one of those photons had been stretched by a factor of 1,100. And therefore, its energy had gotten 1,100 times smaller. And so instead of seeing something glowing with a temperature of 3,000 degrees, like looking at the surface of a red giant star, uh, we see the universe glowing with a temperature of about 2.7 degrees. Now, I say that, um, but you actually have to go and you can't just do, uh, know that by looking at the universe and measuring the, the intensity at one temperature. What you have to do is you have to go and measure it at many different temperatures and notice and, and check that you get what's called black body radiation. What is black body radiation? Well, if we have something hot, like, like this lava, it will glow. Okay. And will glow in a way that is characterized by whatever temperature the lava is at. So if I had candle flames of different temperatures, and this is not completely accurate because candles aren't, flames like this aren't perfect black bodies. But the hotter the flame is, the bluer it is. The cooler the flame is, the redder it is. So different temperature objects glow with different spectra. So here's a representation of that. So something red doesn't emit a lot of photons. Something cool with a temperature of 3,000 degrees doesn't emit as many photons as something with a temperature of 4,000 degrees or something with a temperature of 5,000 degrees. That's why the hotter the temperature is, the higher these curves are. You'll also notice that the peak of each of these curves is at a slightly different place. Right? The hotter the temperature is, the, the smaller the wavelength at which it peaks. Okay? That's why the 3,000 degree object looks red, the 4,000 degree object looks a little yellower or greener, and the 5,000 degree object looks a little bluer. Okay? So as we increase the temperature of an object, it emits more and more radiation, and the peak wavelength of that radiation gets shorter, or the peak energy gets higher. Okay. And the particular shape here is called a black body spectrum. The first experiment to really measure that black body spectrum, to really check that what we were seeing is a hot glow, was called the Cosmic Background Explorer, and in particular, an instrument on it called the Far Infrared Absolute Spectrophotometer, which is a mouthful, so it's called FIRAS. And uh, it, was, uh, oh, it was put together by a fellow named George Smoot, and uh, he, he was, sorry, John Mather, and uh, he was the principal investigator on that and eventually won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for that discovery. And we'll see this COBE experiment a little bit later, but here is that curve measured by COBE FIRAS, and in which the error bars have been blown up by a factor of 
400. So you can imagine these little, what that says is it, all of the data points, those are these little dots with little bars on them, really lie, lay exactly on this curve that they would if this was a black body with a temperature of just over 2.7 degrees. I'm confused. Are these protons the same all the time as they're circling the Earth? These are photons. Protons. No, photons. Photons. These Sorry. are photons, particles Photon. of light. Okay? And these particles of light are traveling through the universe. The universe is full of them. Okay? So here we are sitting here, and if, you know, if, there is, if there is nothing above us, if you're in nice, a nice place where they could get to the surface, uh, like in Antarctica or up on top of, you know, uh, out in some, some desert somewhere, then th they would come and they would hit our, de our, our detector, detectors that, uh, that John will tell you about next week. How do the uh, humps, whatever they, you want to call them, how do they affect the Earth, the 4,000, 5,000 uh, uh, degree temperatures? If the sun, for example, is close to a black body of temperature of about uh, 50, 800, if I remember correctly, degrees. Okay, so it affects the Earth a lot, right? We get the we get the we get the uh, photons from the sun, the particles of light from the sun, and they do everything for us, all sorts of things. Uh, the particles of light from distant stars, uh, there are so few of them, they don't do very much except you know give us beautiful night skies and clear places like you know not Cleveland. Okay, but we can see some of them, and they're beautiful. Okay? The particles of light from the microwave background. They are so, they have so little energy, they do very little for us. Um, you, can, you can see them if you build, a, you build yourself a nice de uh, microwave detector, okay, like the, like, like the ones that I'll show you some of them, like these satellites out in space, or the ones that uh, go up in balloons, we'll talk about uh, some of those as well. Um, but mostly they, they don't do anything practical and they don't have much daily influence. You, you used to be able to see them when you used to be able to turn on your television and, with an antenna. Okay, and, and you know you got that fuzz so, you know, between stations, and some part of that, and I've heard numbers like 5% and 10%, it probably you know, depends where you are, some part of that fuzz was actually the microwave background radiation. Okay. Was there any practical use to that fuzz? No, not really, it was annoying, you know, it was noisy when you turned it on, you had to change channels, but that was about it. But it is, but it, that, that, that haze of, 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 uh, of photons has been traveling through the universe for 13 and a half billion years. And it is our best piece of evidence and our best tool for discovering what the universe was like when it was 380,000 years old, and even when it was like in tiny fractions of a second old. You say that they're getting weaker and weaker. Will they ever just dissipate? So the photons continue to get stretched to longer and longer. They also continue to be less and less dense. In other words, there's, there's, right now there are a couple of hundred of them in every cubic centimeter. So if we went out, out into space outside the Earth and took a box a centimeter on a side, there would be a few hundred photons in there. Okay. As the universe expands, the number of photons doesn't change. Their energy gets lower and they get farther apart. Okay. Eventually, so over time it gets more and more difficult to detect them. But you know, for the, four C over, the, the, the amount of time it takes for, for their energy to change by a factor of two is about 10 billion years. Okay, so over our lifetime, it will be difficult, although people are interested in doing it, it'll be difficult to see any change in, in either their energy or their den density. We just don't, we don't have 10 billion years to wait. But if you wait long enough, yes, there'll be fewer of them. They'll be, they'll be, they get redder and redder or less and less energetic and it gets harder and harder to detect them. Glenn, you, you talked about the uh, uh, time before 380,000 years of age in which the uh, temperature was in excess of 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and uh, it was so energetic that uh, atoms really weren't stable. They get blown apart. So that, that is similar environment to what's on the inside of the sun. So is the same thing happening there? And if not, why not? Ah, so yes, inside the sun, atoms of high, you know, so the sun is made mostly of hydrogen and helium, okay? but it's not atoms of hydrogen and helium when you go on the inside. It's much too hot for the atoms to stay there. The atoms are all ionized. In other words, the electrons are being knocked off by a combination of very energetic photons hitting the atoms and also by the, the atoms colliding into each other and, and knocking the electrons off. So yeah, inside, inside of stars, there aren't many neutral atoms. There's mostly ionized 
atoms, so ions. Exactly the same, very, very similar. Not precisely the same environment, but, but, but there are a lot of similarities. So what we see, as we said, is this very, very uniform glow coming from every direction on the sky. Okay? It's very smooth, and we say it's very highly correlated. In other words, if you tell me the temperature there, I can tell you what the temperature is over there. It's the same. And one question is, how did it get this smooth? It's very surprising that the universe is this smooth. In other words, the temperature is the same in different directions. Why? Well, we have this idea that information only travels at the speed of light. And so if I look out over there, and I'm getting photons, I'm getting light from over there, and it's arriving here now, and I look over there, and I'm getting light from that place over there, and it's arriving here now. That means light has had exactly enough time to travel from over there to here, and from over there to here. And that would seem to mean that light didn't have time to travel from over there to over there. Well, if light didn't have time to travel from over there to over there, how did those two places end up at the same temperature? It would be like I asked each of you to come in today, tonight with a glass of water. Okay? And you each brought in your glasses and were holding them. They came from different places. And as you walked in the door, I measured your glasses of water. And their temperatures were exactly the same to a part in 100,000. Because that's the, that is the precision to which the, different, the temperature is the same in different directions. Now, the, only ex the, the best explanation for that would be if you had actually there had been a bucket just outside, outside, and you had actually just dipped your glass into the, into the bucket before you came in, in. And so actually, they were coming from the same bucket. That's why they were the same temperature. So how, can it, how could that be? Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you probably you might have read in recent newspaper articles about something called inflation. That is our explanation for how the universe manages to get so smooth. It was first proposed by this fellow named Alan Guth, professor at MIT, and, um, and significantly improved upon by these three folks, Paul Steinhardt, Andy Albrecht, and Andre Linde, who are at uh, uh, Princeton, UC Davis, and Stanford. Uh, back in the 1980s. And what they proposed is that the universe at one point was dominated, that the most important source of energy was the energy of empty space, the energy of nothing. Okay. So we call that, also call that the energy of the vacuum. And you might not think that empty space could have energy. Because when we say empty space, what, what do we mean? Well, what, what we mean, what we normally mean by empty space is that it's empty of particles. We've taken all the particles that we possibly can out. But it may not be empty of other things. It may not be empty of fields. Well, what kind of fields? It might be like the electric field. There could be an electric field in the universe, or there could be a magnetic field. It turns out those probably weren't there to any significant extent in the early universe, certainly not enough to cause this thing, this thing called inflation. Okay. Um, it might have been not empty of the Higgs field, which is a different field. But whatever that field is called, um, whatever that field is, it behaves in a very different way than the energy due to particles. Okay. And that's because as space expands, if it's filled with vacuum energy, you just get more and more vacuum energy. Why is that? Well, imagine a box like this in which there is nothing. So that box doesn't have apples in it. It doesn't have protons in it. It doesn't have electrons in it. It just has empty space in it. But there's energy associated with empty space. Well, if I make the box bigger, then there is now much more empty space inside the box, and therefore much more energy inside the box. And it sounds like you're getting something for nothing, and you are, because empty space is different than boxes of particles. Boxes with empty space, if you stretch them, then you manage to get more empty space and more energy associated with that empty space, unlike boxes of particles. Now, it turns out that if you have 
a universe filled with this empty space, that this process of expanding the boxes and thereby generating more energy drives an exponential expansion. It's an exponential process. You expand the box, you get more energy, it drives more expansion. And so you get this, this exponential expansion is called inflation. And we believe that there was a period of inflation early in the universe driven by a field that, whose identity we haven't figured out. We, in fact, don't believe it's any of the fields we know. So you've heard of the Higgs boson pro probably recently. It's probably not driven by the field associated with the Higgs boson. It's probably not driven by electric fields or magnetic fields. And we call the field that dro drove it, whatever it was, the inflaton field. So if the universe was very rough, very um, uh, not smooth at all, like we would have expected, kind of like if we looked over there, we would have expected the, the temperature and the density to be different than the temperature and density over there. If the universe was like that when it began and it inflated, then what would happen is that the universe would be getting stretched and it would appear smoother. So let's look at that again. Here the universe appears quite rough, but when we stretch the the universe, it starts to appear smoother. Now I've only made that universe, that sheet of crumpled paper behind the circle, grow by a factor of four. But we believe that inflation caused the universe to expand by factors of a billion, billion, billion or more. And in doing so, it leaves behind a universe that is very, very smooth and also very, very empty. And then what happens is the energy associated with that vacuum decays and is released into ordinary particles. So that is the story of, of inflation. Okay. Now, that inflation causes there to be slight differences in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background in every direction. That's a good thing because the universe doesn't look like that. It doesn't look smooth the same everywhere you look. Why not? Well, look around this room. We see, we see that the, the, this room is not smooth. There are people in it. There are chairs in it. Look further afield. We see that space isn't smooth. It's full of planets and stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So our universe is not empty space. It's full of all sorts of lumps. And those lumps had to have come from somewhere. So the microwave background that we look at and see that appears initially to be very smooth, the same in every direction, can't possibly be exactly the same in every direction. If we look carefully, we have to be able to see small differences. And those two are generated by inflation. How is that? Well, I described to you how empty space, what we call the vacuum, is the thing driving inflation. But empty space not only is, isn't empty of energy, not only is there energy associated with empty space, but empty space is changing all the time. When we use the word vacuum, we kind of have this picture of you know, a vacuum cleaner which pulls everything out. But remember we said that when you, after you pull everything out, there can be something left over. And it's that something that is driving inflation. It's called the quantum vacuum. Now, the quantum vacuum doesn't look smooth. The quantum vacuum is fluctuating all of the time. There are things appearing and disappearing in the, in the quantum vacuum at every moment. And we've seen this. We've actually known this and measured this since the 1930s, because this appearing and disappearing of particles in the quantum vacuum affects the energy levels of hydrogen. It affects how an electron goes around a proton inside a hydrogen atom. So when we look out there and, see, we should, we, and, and, and look at this universe generated by inflation, this universe that has been made very, very smooth by inflation, we should expect that even though it's smooth, there should be little tiny ripples that were also generated by inflation. And indeed, one of the other instruments on this, uh, on this satellite called COBE, and here's a picture of the COBE satellite. It, or, it went into orbit around the Earth in the early 1990s and made these measurements. And we talked about the measurements of a black body, but it also made a map of the microwave background radiation. 
So remember our, the map I initially showed you, the microwave background radiation, looks something like this. Very, very smooth with the temperature of about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Okay. But when you looked more carefully, as Kobe was able to do, you got a map that looked more like this. Now the difference is that these hot and cold spots are only a few millionths of a degree hotter than the background. So they had to measure the temperature of individual directions of the, of the light coming from individual directions to parts in a, a few parts in a million. Okay. And they saw, in fact, that there were cold spots and hot spots. They also saw this, please ignore this bright band through the middle. That's just our galaxy. That wasn't the interesting part. It's all the other stuff that they were able to see. And those were the imprints of inflation on the early universe. Those were the fluctuations generated by inflation very early in the history of the universe, a tiny fraction of a second after, uh, after the beginning of the universe. Okay. Now, there are in fact all sorts of different ways that those fluctuations arise. There are what are called primary fluctuations, also known as intrinsic temperature fluctuations. In other words, the stuff over there might have been a little bit hotter than the stuff over there where the light was coming from. So when the light got, when, when, the, when the photons started their journey, they started their journeys from slightly places that had slightly different temperatures. Okay. There's also something called the, uh, the, sac the Doppler effect. And this is Christian Doppler an Austrian physicist from the 1800s. And um, the material over there was moving. Okay? It wasn't standing still. So all the material was moving around. And if it was moving towards us, then the light will appear a little bit more energetic, a little bit hotter. And if it was moving away from us, it'll appear a little bit cooler. There's also something called the sachs wolf effect after these two folks. Kurt Sachs and Art Wolf. And they said, well, if it's a little bit denser, if there's a little more, more gravity here than here, then the photons will have to climb out of a deeper gravitational well. They actually have to climb up a hill, you can think of it. And so they'll lose more energy when they come from denser regions than when they come from less dense regions. There's also things that happen to the photons as they travel through the universe. They've, after all, they've been traveling for 13 and a half billion years. The journey might not be completely uneventful. It's mostly uneventful, but it's not completely uneventful. So for example, the photons can be lensed. They can, their paths can be bent by gravity. They can also travel, as they, tra as they travel along, they could fall into gravitational wells. In other words, they could enter things like a big giant cluster. Okay? And as they fall in and then climb out, their energy when they come out may not be quite the same as when they fall in because the cluster itself is changing. The, 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 uh, the gravitational well that they fall into is changing. Okay? They can experience something called the sunyev zeldovich effect after this fellow Rashid Sunyav and this fellow Jakob Zeldovich, okay. in which they scatter off of material inside of clusters. Okay. So as the, as the photons travel through the clusters, they can hit electrons in the clusters. So there's all sorts of things that can happen to the particles as they go along. And that's what Kobe was measuring. It was measuring the sum of all those things. So instead of just being able to see this uniform glow, they were able to see all of these effects superimposed on a map of the sky. But that map is the imprint, almost all of it, of inflation on our early universe and on the universe in between the last scattering surface and us. It was a lot easier when it was all done by the Buffalo God. But uh, the moment of the Big Bang, are you saying that at that moment of inflation, it was a hot, dense state, but a hot, dense state of nothing? No. So we don't know, we don't know what the universe was like before inflation. Okay. So, but inflation gets started, and the universe is full of that. The only, uh, initially, there may be some things in the universe other than vacuum energy. But as the universe expands, those all get diluted away. 
right? But how so, how would inflation how would inflation overcome the gravitational powers of that of whatever was there? So if there's if there's too much the if there's too much stuff initially in the universe, then inflation never gets started, and in fact the universe might collapse instead of inflating. But if there's a little little enough stuff then inflation can get started. And in any place where it gets started, what happens is the universe starts to grow and grow and grow. And as its volume gets bigger, the amount of stuff in it gets, is the same, but the volume is bigger. And so the influence of the stuff that was in there to begin with becomes less and less important. Okay? But all this so, is taking place in about a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. So, over the course of a very short amount of time or a very long time. Inflation might last an incredibly long time, but there's this period where the universe is expanding and expanding and expanding and becoming more and more empty until essentially there's nothing in it but vacuum energy. And then what happens, and exactly there are various, depending on the model of inflation that you, you uh, calculate with, what happen, uh, why exactly what happens, but somehow that energy of the vacuum decays, and it turns into ordinary stuff. It turns into particles of light, photons, and it turns into W bosons, and Higgs bosons, and electrons, and quarks, and all, the, all, of, all of this stuff, and all of normal stuff, and presumably all sorts of dark matter. Okay? And we date, the, we date the beginning of the universe from the end of inflation. So if, someone, if I tell you that the universe is 380,000 years old, what I mean is 380,000 years from the moment that inflation ended. Okay? So the end of inflation is the beginning of what we call the hot Big Bang period. Okay? It kind of resets the clock everywhere in the universe that we see. So the universe is pretty much the same everywhere. It's hot and dense with only very small fluctuations, a part in 100,000. So that's the end of inflation, not the beginning of inflation. Right, the end of inflation, that's what the universe is like. What, what it was like before that, we don't really know. Is it possible to go beyond our universe and measure whether inflation is in other bodies? So almost by definition of, that, of the word universe, the answer is no. In other words, what, what do we mean by the universe is we mean all places that, can, that we can get to, you know, that information can arrive to us, or from those places, all places that can be measured, or from those places, all places that can be measured. So we can't, by definition, if we can get there, if, if we can measure it, it's in our universe. Okay. Now, there are, there are more speculative theories that have to do with things called the multiverse. Um, but almost by definition, again, the other places, the places other than our universes are places that we can't get to. So, that, so no. We can't get to other places and see if inflation happened there. Now, we can ask in our, in our theory, are there other places, and would inflation have happened there? And, and there it depends, again, enormously on your theory. So in the, I'd say, the most prevalent version of what people think of is going on, in fact, in most places in some bigger entity, inflation is still going on. And the places in which inflation is stopped is very rare, are very rare. Uh, they also happen to be the only places that, that are interesting because they're the only places where the universe is hot and, and galaxies formed and stars formed and, you know. Uh, but, so when, it's not just that we're lucky to live there, we couldn't be living if inflation was going on because the universe would be empty and cold. Okay. So, but there are other versions, you know, there are other theories in which it's a, it's a different description. So. We're not sure. It's hard, to, it's hard to know about things that you can't measure. Right? It's, it's, you, know, you, you can follow the mathematics and tell stories about them, but it's really hard to know. If, if ultimately, if you can't make a measurement, you're not really sure what the answer is. So here is that map of the universe that Kobe made back in the 1990s. Now, people haven't stopped there. Um, Kobe was a satellite that was in orbit around the Earth. Uh, in the early 2000s, something called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe uh, was, was sent up by NASA, and it uh, looks something like this. Here's a picture of it. It actually went into orbit much further away, uh, about 1% of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, away from the Sun, uh, is, a, is a place called one of, one of the Lagrange points. 
In other words, if you put something there, it'll actually go around the sun in exactly a year, just like the Earth. And that means that you can keep the Earth, the moon, and the sun in one part of the sky and look away from them. It's a very good place to do all sorts of astronomy. And people are sending a lot of satellites there. And they made a map that looked like this. It's a map of the same sky. It's just much better resolution. Uh, you'll notice they also don't have a galaxy there. That's not because they left the galaxy. It's because they were able to put together a bunch of different maps measured at different frequencies and infer what part was galaxy and what part wasn't. And this map shows the part that is believed to be entirely the microwave background. More recently, in fact, currently, a, uh, a European uh, uh, satellite called the Planck satellite here is shown not in space but on the ground. This is a real picture of it uh, being prepared for launch. Uh, was put out at the same, in the same Lagrange point, And it made an even more detailed map of the sky. Uh, we don't always make our measurements from the sky. In fact, sometimes we make them from the ground or sometimes we make them near the ground. Um, and that has many advantages, one of which is uh, it's not quite so expensive. It also doesn't take as long, long to do. Uh, and, uh, John, who will talk to you next week, is, was part of this experiment called Boomerang. Uh, this is a, you know, maybe almost as difficult to get to as space. It's the South, was this, this is the South Pole? Uh, yeah, McMurdo. This is at McMurdo, okay, so that, down in Antarctica. And uh, after, you get, after you get your, uh, your telescope ready, your microwave telescope ready, you uh, also get a balloon ready, and then you send it off uh, into the upper atmosphere. And uh, this is actually, so this is Boomerang. This is another, uh, another experiment that went up called Maxima. So two, two of the um, early and very successful ballooning experiments that made important measurements of the universe from the microwave background. So our, uh, our objective isn't just to detect the microwave background. It's to use the, the, that map of the microwave background to look at, to read the universe to understand the properties of the early universe and of the universe that we live in. So what kind of things do we want to know? Well, we'd like to know the geometry of the universe. And that's, we have here three pictures that illustrate the three main different types of geometry that we could have. This is the, on the bottom is the geometry we all learned in, in grade school. It's called Euclidean geometry, you, you know, where the sum of the angles of the triangle are 180 degrees and parallel lines never intersect. It's also called flat space. Okay. But it could be that space is curved, positively curved, like the surface of the Earth. So in fact, if you think about triangles on the surface of the Earth, the sum of their angles of a triangle are actually bigger than 180 degrees. And parallel lines actually do intersect on the surface of the Earth. And uh, in a negatively curved space, the sum of the angles of a triangle are less than 180 degrees. And so we, we would like to know. Do parallel lines in the universe intersect? Are, are triangles, uh, do they sum to 180 degrees? We'd also like to know um, what's in the universe. And many of you, whoop, many of you saw those people who disappeared. Uh, here's one of them. This is uh, Dan Akrib, one of, one of our colleagues, uh, in front of uh, parts of what's called the Lux experiment. Uh, and here are Dan and Tom giving a talk at the uh, Happy Dog uh, uh, Grill over on the west side. Uh, and they look for dark matter in, deep in, under, in an underground laboratory. But we can also look for dark matter or the effects of dark matter on the microwave background. Okay. Here, and here is, here is their experiment deep underground in, uh, in a mine in South Dakota called the Lux experiment. We'd like to know about what we call baryons, which means heavy particles. It means protons and neutrons, ordinary stuff. And we learned a lot about the, how much ordinary stuff there is by measuring the abundances of light elements like helium and deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, and lithium. Okay. But we can also learn about how many baryons there are by measuring the microwave background. We'd like to know whether the universe is, how the universe is growing now. And by looking at supernovae, and this is an a, a artist's um, uh, vision, picture of a, a type, what's called a type 1 supernova, people have used type 1 supernovae to measure the expansion of the universe. And they've noticed that the expansion of the universe is not slowing down as we might have expected from ordinary gravity, but actually accelerating. 
We can look for that effect also in the microarray background. And the way we do that is by looking at something called the temperature power spectrum. What does that mean? Well, you see a curve here. You also see dots on it. But pay attention at the, for the moment at, at the curve. And you notice it had bump, has bumps and wiggles. Okay? The bumps mean that at that particular angle, so if we look at features of that size, say one degree or half a degree or two degrees, um, that as a function of the angular scale of different features on the sky, how many of them are there? How strong are they? How, how loud are they, if you like? Okay. And um, by measuring the how strong, how many different features of, a diff of different sizes there are on the, micro on the sky in the, in the microwave background, we try to test whether the curve that we predict, this pink curve, okay, is actually what we see. Now, this was in fact the state of the art a couple of years ago, but it was the best, is the best uh, graph that, that I saw showing all the different things. And, uh, and you'll see that these dots lie pretty close to this curve, which is suggesting that our theory is pretty good. Okay? But you could, the, exactly the shapes of these bumps and wiggles depends on things like how many baryons there are, how much dark matter there is, what the, what the geometry of the universe is, whether the universe is accelerating or decelerating. Okay? So we want to go out and measure the temperature power spectrum to infer all these properties of the universe. Why all these bumps and wiggles? Well, it's because inflationary fluctuations, those, those little um, <clears throat> fluctuations of, 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 of hotter and colder or denser and less dense coming out of inflation turn into sound waves in the early universe. Okay. And those, some of those sound waves become louder than others. They get processed as, as the universe ages from the time of inflation until the time of this last scattering. So from a tiny fraction of a second until the universe is 380,000 years old, some of the sound gets louder than others. Okay. It's how the sound evolves in the early universe. So what we're really looking at that graph, when we look at all those bumps and wiggles, we're looking at notes. We're looking at really the, the, sound, the sounds that are, running, are traveling through the universe, and we're looking at how loud the different notes are. Okay. So that is a picture of the, so the sound spectrum of the universe. So for example, if we want to measure the shape of space, then it turns out that what we want to do is figure out the size of the largest, longest, the lowest note that could have traveled. Sorry, we want to measure how far a note could have traveled through the universe. And that turns out to tell us where exactly that first big bump should be. It actually tells us where all the bumps should be. But if the universe is flat, then that bump should sit right about at one degree. And if the universe was curved like a sphere, it should sit at, at a larger angle. And if it was curved like that other, that other funny shape, kind of like a, a potato chip, negatively curved, it would sit at a smaller angle. And when we go out and measure it, it turns out that it sits, it sits right exactly at, oops, it sits right exactly at precisely the angle that it should if the universe was flat. So the universe, in the universe, it appears that parallel lines do not intersect. And the sum of the angles of a triangle really are 180 degrees, unlike the surface of the Earth. If we want to look for the, that ordinary stuff, then we have to look at what happens to the heights of each of these different peaks in the temperature power spectrum when we increase the amount, number of ordinary particles. Okay. And it turns out that increasing the number of baryons, increasing the number of protons and neutrons makes all the peaks higher. Okay. But it makes the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh, all the odd peaks, it has more of an effect on them than it does on the even peaks. So by looking at the ratios of the heights of the different peaks, we can learn how much ordinary stuff there is. The dark matter does something similar. Okay. Except it moves the locations of the peaks. Okay. So increasing the amount of dark matter moves the peaks. It also changes this low, low, this stuff down here at the bottom. Okay. It changes its height. It, it raises or lowers it. Accelerating the universe 
it causes this, the, the acceleration that we, we see in the universe today with the supernovas, it would cause this turn up down here, where instead of going down, the curve turns up a little. Okay. So acceleration does that. So by measuring the shape of that curve, we're able to infer the geometry of the universe and also what the universe is made of. And what we find is that the stuff responsible for acceleration makes up something like, and it depends where, exactly which measurement you take, but something like 70 to 72 or 73 percent of the energy of the universe. Ordinary stuff makes up about 4 percent. That's it. So all of the stuff that we see, all the stars, all the glowing gas, anything that we see with our telescopes accounts for all of that added together amounts to only 4 percent of all of the energy in the universe. And dark matter, the stuff that is holding up galaxies together, makes up about 23, or 20, 23 to 25 percent of the energy density of the universe. And we learn that by looking at those patterns in the temperature power spectrum, in the microwave background. Now, I've told you all those things about what we learned, and I told you that it's all due to inflation. We actually were, don't know that. So we have this theory inflation that tells us all these things, um, and it did, did, does an, an absolutely remarkable job. But the question is, could any other theory do just as good a job? And I'd say until, oh, about six weeks ago, a month ago, three weeks ago maybe, until a few weeks ago, uh, I think the jury was completely, you know, was really very much out on that. You, you, there are people out there who'd say, well, there are certain things we have to look for that would really be signs of inflation. Okay. And a few weeks ago, a result was announced um, that we're going to hear about next week that really, I think, if it turns out to be confirmed, is, uh, is going to change that and really give us a great deal more confidence that what really is lying behind all of these is inflation. So thank you. <laughs>